So today we are concluding our message series called Unafraid. And over the past three weeks, we have been looking at different elements of fear, different characteristics of fear. We've been looking at uh, how fear manifests itself in our, in our bodies, in our spirits, in our souls. And last week, we focused on this story from the book of Numbers, the story where the Israelites are on the edge of the promised land, and they are about to enter, uh, but Moses sends in uh, 12 spies to go into the land to check it out, and uh, 10 of those spies come back and start telling the people all the things that they should be afraid of. They start telling them that the, the cities are fortified and no one's going to be able to come up against them. They say that the uh, people seem like giants and to, to them, uh, the Israelites must seem like grasshoppers. And all of a sudden, the people begin to kind of shake in their boots, as you will, and they start complaining and saying, well, maybe we should never should have come out of Egypt in the first place, and maybe we should elect a leader and lead us right back into slavery where we were. And this giant that wasn't even there until the spies came back, all of a sudden, this giant fear is out there. And we talked about what it takes to begin to bring those giants back down to size so that we can really look at what we fear right in the face. Well, behavioral scientists have identified and named this sort of tactic as being what they call exposure therapy. That Often, the way that we behave is that when we are anxious about something or when we are fearing something, we want to try and avoid it, right? We just want to maybe shove it under the rug, pretend it's not there, look the other way. But exposure therapy says, no, in order to really tackle these giants, to tackle these anxieties and fears and worries is that we need to face them. We need to actually uh, stare them right in the eye. And exposure therapy breaks this cycle by calling us to clearly identify the source of our fear and anxiety and then to slowly face our fears by exposing ourselves to them. At first, in very small steps, then gradually increasing the experience of exposure. Now, I think all of us, we might not call it exposure therapy, but I think we've all had incidents of this, or we have helped maybe our children to experience and face some of their fears as well. So uh, think about for you, how many of, for you, was it really easy to just jump in that pool for the first time and start swimming? My wife, excellent. Excellent. I know it was, I mean, I, I, I now can say, you know, I ended up on the high school swim team and, and swam competitively for a while, but the first few times that I was at that pool and thinking about jumping in, there was a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety about that. And thankfully, I had a neighbor uh, who was a wonderful teacher, and she let us come and, and walk in on the shallow end of her pool for a long time and then gradually say, well, Ryan, why don't you... Why don't you put your face in the water, you know? Why don't you, why don't you use your arms here? Why don't you tilt your head a little bit to the side? And all of a sudden, it's like, well, why don't you jump off the side or the diving board? And, and before you knew it, I'm swimming without any fear. Or how about riding a bicycle? You know, a lot of us, you know, if you had training wheels, maybe that was kind of that first gradual step to get on the bike and get comfortable with it. Or, or maybe you had mom or dad or somebody behind you that was sort of holding on to the bike for you as you pedaled and getting used to that feel and that balance. But, you know, I know one of my fears was falling off, right? You know, what happens if I fall off? Well, sometimes we need to fall off a few times to feel that, you know, hey, we survived, you know? And... That's another way of exposure therapy. Well, my son had a, a version of this uh, just a few months ago when we went to uh, Walt Disney World. And, uh, you know, I'm a big roller coaster fan. My, my family has always been big roller coaster fans. And, and Kenneth, we 
Started him very early, kind of going on the small kitty coasters at the fair, at Valley Fair or something like that. And he was okay with that. Well, there is a roller coaster at Walt Disney World called Expedition Everest. Uh, my son refers to it as Yeti Mountain. Now, this is a pretty big roller coaster at, at Walt Disney World. In fact, it doesn't go upside down, but it's probably like the steepest drop and probably gets up the, the highest rate of speed. And he was kind of excited about it, but then he's like, I don't know, I don't think I'm going to go. And then we got over by it, and of course, what happens on a roller coaster, but people start to what? Yeah, so here, people coming down this big steep slope as it angles around and goes into this mountain, and you just hear people going, ah, and you can just see his face kind of tense up like, like I don't think I want to do this. And so then, the, then the, the, the process begins of talking to him about it. Well, now you've ridden this other roller coaster, and that wasn't so bad, right? And, you know, and, and remember, they, they're not, they didn't design it for anybody to fall out. They don't want anybody to be injured, and, and it's going to be safe, and... And, well, you know, we went through all these things, and, of course, what works but actual bribery. <laughs> His cousin came and said, well, if you go on the ride, you'll get this stuffed Yeti. I'll buy you this stuffed Yeti. Well, that got him to say, okay, I'll, I'll face my fear. I'll give, it a, I'll give it a try. And he did it. Now, I think... There was still some concern as he kind of get, and he said he closed his eyes in a lot of parts of it, but you know what? Ever since then, now we've been talking about, well, you, you rode Yeti Mountain, right? This is going to seem like nothing to you, right? It was a facing of a fear type of thing, and he did it. And we all have little victories like that, I think, in our lives. And I think we have to celebrate those victories. Now, Adam Hamilton's daughter, uh, Adam Hamilton wrote a book called Unafraid. Well, he, he has a, a college-age daughter now, and uh, he found out when she came home for break one time that she had joined the skydiving club. And he said, I can't believe you joined the skydiving club. You know, what are you thinking? You know, and he said, oh, I was really reacting out of my own fear. But this is the way that she describes that experience. She said, As a trainee, the jump began by the instructor throwing open the door of the plane next to which you were sitting. Being on the edge of the plane, looking out at the ground below, was terrifying and exhilarating. Once you worked up the courage, you would grab on to a bar that connected the wing of the plane to the body and pull yourself out so that you were flying along parallel to the plane for a few seconds while your body got into a spread eagle position. Then you had to decide if you were going to let go. She says it's a totally unique vantage point from which to view the world. Calm and removed from all worry and chaos, a place where you can be a simple observer. And once your feet touch the ground, the rush returns and you feel like you could do anything. After all, she says, you have looked death in the face and said, not today. Now, most of the things we're afraid of are not nearly as frightening as they seem. But the only way we'll learn this is to face our fears with faith. Faith that will survive the roller coaster. Faith that our parachute will open and allow us to fall slowly to the earth. Now, confronting our fears face to face, head on, might not always be the recommended course of action. But for many of our fears, facing them liberates us, which is what Ralph Waldo Emerson meant when he said, do the thing you fear, and death of fear is certain. Now, Adam Hamilton says very wisely that many people attack their anxieties and fears by taking medication, which can be really helpful, especially for those who struggle with anxiety disorders, panic attacks, obsessive-compulsive disorder, or even post-traumatic stress. 
And as we've begun to see, therapists can offer important insights into how we address our fears and find relief. But thousands of years before Freud and Jung and Skinner offered their observations about the human mind, and before the world was introduced to medicines intended to treat anxiety and fear, the primary place human beings turned to to find relief from fear was their faith in God and the spiritual practices that helped them to sense God's presence. For fear and finding peace in the face of it is one of the major themes of the Bible. The words fear or afraid appear over 400 times in Scripture. And God's instruction, as we talked about a few weeks ago, to not be afraid or to not fear appear more than a hundred times in the Bible. These words are often most spoken in frightening or unnerving situations, times of natural dis- national disaster, or when Israel's enemies were attacking, or when the people were asking God to step in and help them. They were spoken in the midst of storms when facing death and when a situation seemed hopeless. But the one phrase that follows it that is so important for us to always make sure we're adding as well is it's not just don't be afraid or fear not, but it's to put that phrase, for God is with us. That is so vitally important. Now, if we go back to that story of the Israelite spies, we say 10 of them came back and shared about how they should be fearing what's in the land. But two came back and said, no, we need to go right now. God is with us. This is the time to take the promised land. And for them, they knew that there was something very important about God's presence being with them, that it undergirded them, it gave them a foundation, it gave them hope. You see, for the Israelites who had just seen God deliver them from the Egyptians and who had been assured that God would be with them in their fight with the Canaanites, their faith, their trust, their confidence in God should have fundamentally changed their perspective on the giants in the land of Canaan or the perceived giants in the land of Canaan. If they had trusted God, they would have looked at the Canaanites and understood that when compared to the God who parted the Red Sea, the Canaanites were the ones who looked like grasshoppers. Things radically change when we trust that God is with us and fighting for us. That's how Joshua and Caleb saw things as they urged the Israelites to move ahead in taking the promised land. They were acting in faith on God's promises to be with them. God's presence and power radically changed how they faced their fears. Now, Adam Hamilton reminds us that this same promise from God shows up hundreds of years later in another time of great fear for the Israelites. In 586 B.C., the Babylonian armies had destroyed Jerusalem and subsequently forced many of the Israelites to resettle in Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. They were helpless against the power of the Babylonian Empire. But things were about to change. Within decades, Cyrus the Great of Persia and his armies would conquer the Babylonian Empire and pretty much every other empire in its path. And years before the battle for Babylon began, God told the Israelites that very same promise that I talked with the kids about earlier. Through the prophet Isaiah, 
He said, don't fear because I am with you. Don't be afraid for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will surely uphold you. I will help you and I will hold you with my righteous, strong hand. And God was with the Israelites in that time. For when Cyrus and the Persian Empire came in, they allowed all of the Israelites who had been in exile to return home, to begin rebuilding their temple, to begin rebuilding their faith. It was astounding and something the Jews believed only God had orchestrated. Now, with the kids, I explained about my own, our own cats that we have at home and how when they are fearful and frightened, their perspective changes, right? They, all of a sudden, a cat that might not be afraid of the vacuum cleaner is all of a sudden curled up in a ball in the corner, kind of shivering. Well, Adam Hamilton has a dog named Maybell. And Maybell, as most dogs or some dogs can be, gets very frightened by a couple of things, thunder and fireworks. And he shares a story in his book about a time when uh, they were on vacation and uh, happened to be in a place where fireworks were allowed all year long. And they were around the lake, and all of a sudden, as a nightly ritual, the fireworks almost start going off. And not just small fireworks, you know, but these big, booming fireworks. And so he said it was almost a nightly ritual for their dog, Mabel, to go running under the bed and starting to shiver in fear. And so they started to think, well, how can we help her through this? And did you know that there is such a thing called a thunder shirt? He says there are two things that calm Mabel when she's afraid of these terrifying noises. The first is, as we talked about, to be held snugly in someone's arms, close to a trusted person. But the second is something called a thunder shirt, a vest that wraps around her neck and chest and then gets Velcroed tightly around her. It has the same effect on a dog as that swaddling has on an infant. The dog feels safe as though she were being held. And he says that when his wife and and he first bought the Thunder shirt, he said he was skeptical. There's no way this thing will work, I told her. But to my surprise, it did. When Maybelle is terrified of things she doesn't understand, things that are not really a threat to her but which she thinks are a threat, the act of being held or being wrapped in a shirt that makes her feel like she is being held takes away her fear and gives her peace. And that is an effect that our faith in God, our prayer, our reading of Scripture, our singing hymns and meditating upon God's power, presence, and love has on so many people as well. It acts like a thunder shirt. It calms the anxious soul. Now, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, described the human version of a thunder shirt 2,000 years ago when he gave this advice for addressing worry, fear, and anxiety to a young Christian community. He said, The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. So I began this message series with Pastor Hamilton's words, and I will close it with his words as well. He says, We can focus our imagination on all the things that might happen, and by inflating the threats or obstacles we face, We turn them into giants, 
where we can focus our imagination on the presence of God through prayer, singing hymns, sharing our struggles with close friends, and other spiritual disciplines. And trust that we will sense his love and mercy holding us near. And when we imagine God's presence and power, we find we can begin to live with courage and hope. Thanks be to God. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. 